Welcome back to 1% Weekly. Today I want to share the sad case of Boris Becker's bankruptcy. I want to talk about some new ways in which small businesses can win some lucrative government contracts. I also want to alert you to a sneaky new charge that's coming your way if you've got a pension plan or a family trust. I'm sure many of us remember watching Boris Becker winning Wimbledon as a very young man and being amazed at his acrobatics and his prowess on the court. Obviously he went on to become a major star of the tennis circuit with, with very you know, prosperous advertising sponsorships and things and he became a very wealthy man. But as is so often the case with people in sport or show business, making money is one thing hanging on to it is quite another. And I think there's quite a lot of lessons we can learn from the, the demise of Boris Becker, which has resulted sadly in his recently declaring bankruptcy. So uh, he I think, owes something like 54 million pounds. He's got assets of about 400,000 pounds. In fact, he was so desperate, he ended up taking a, a two million pound loan from telecoms billionaire, John Cordwell, at an interest rate of 25%. Now, it, it's not quite payday loan territory, but you know, it doesn't take very long for a 25% interest rate to rack up on two million pounds. So, where's he gone wrong? Well, I think probably one of the first things was getting divorced. I, I often say to people, that, you know, the worst aspect of uh, investment and financial planning is spelt D-I-V-O-R-C-E. In his case, it cost him around about $25 million. He then had that uh, unfortunate incident in a broom cupboard that basically, I suppose, triggered the divorce and that cost over another million uh, to the, the, the mother of the child involved there. But I think the most significant thing has actually been to do with his investments. Um, he's put a lot of money into schemes that, like a sporting website and a nutrition company. Uh, one of the biggest losses was from a, a tower block that was going to be built with his name on it in Dubai. Uh, but then he started investing in Nigeria, of all places. Uh, something like, I think, $10 million. So, you know, what huge wads of money just disappearing on these schemes. And of course, once you get into it and you make a, a, a big loss on something, the, sometimes the knee-jerk reaction is to try to do an even bigger transaction to get you back to where you were. But, you know, if you, as, as I've said to you before, if you're 50% down, you need to be 100% up just to get back to where you were. So it's, I think he started taking some bigger gambles and bigger risks. So although he had what appeared to be a kind of family office structure, it's clear that he was not well advised and not well managed. So uh, I think we just need to show that, you know, this is yet another example of where you need to have the right team around you. You need a plan. You need to understand what you can invest in, what the returns are going to be get your tax planning done properly and have a, a proper systematized and planned approach to not just building wealth but critically to protecting wealth. He should have been able to set up wealth that would last for multiple generations with the money he's earned in his career. Now sadly you know he's back to starting all over again uh, presumably making money as a TV pundit or whatever but compared to his glory days he's not going to get that money back so an object lesson for us all in the fact that you need to have the right team in place to plan and manage your finances. If you're running a small business do you even stop to think about whether you could be doing work for the government? It's one of those questions that was actually you know, looked at in a survey recently by the Federation of Small Businesses and they found that in the last 12 months less than a quarter of SMEs have done any work for government contractors. And perhaps even more interestingly only 10% were even thinking about doing so. So the government have actually now made it easier for SMEs to start bidding for these contracts. Because I think, uh, certainly if, uh, my thoughts were always, oh, it's gonna be a huge amount of work, they already know who they're gonna use, I'll just be like in column B, what's the point? You know, so um, I think you know, clearly that's been the attitude, but what they've done now is they've introduced some new rules which say if the contract's worth less than 100,000 pounds, there's a lot less red tape involved. You used to have to fill in something called a pre-qualification questionnaire, which was mind-blowingly complicated. 
You know, only government departments could imagine and dream up this amount of paperwork just to bid for a contract, but they had one. So that doesn't apply if it's below £100,000. Also, what you could do is actually bid as part of a larger contract. So rather than going direct to government, you could go to some of the contractors that are the bigger players and say, look, I'm a specialist in this area. I'd be willing to work on a, a, a small piece of the project below £100,000. And if that all goes well, you'll get a reference from them that would help you to perhaps bid direct for something in the future. Um, I think the, the, there are some online places you can go to to look for these kind of contracts, which could be a good place to start. The, the Crown Commercial Service has set up several sites. One of them is their Contracts Finder, if you just search for uh, CCS Contracts Finder. Another is their e-sourcing tool, and there's also the Dynamic Marketplace, uh, which is buyers.proceserveonline.com. So have a look at those sites and um, you know, really I think it's more a question of changing your thinking about these things because um, the government obviously wants to be seen to have more small businesses working on their procurement. The political will is now with you, whereas perhaps five or ten years ago it wasn't. So I think it's time to stop, think about what you do, think about how you might fit into a government kind of procurement process do you know any of the bigger contractors in your space who are winning contracts regularly? Could you approach them to be one of their kind of sub 100k partners? Not much of a risk for them, is it? If they know you and trust you, they'll bring you in. You can kind of ride on their coattails, get some experience, build some contacts, and also critically get some testimonials. And then next time, maybe you could bid directly for it. And you know, if you're looking at building a business that perhaps you, you're going to exit in the future, you add massive value to it and the multiple you can get for it if you're regularly winning government contracts because they tend to be larger than private clients and they tend to be regular and recurring. So as a value creation mechanism for growing your business, government work could just be something that's worth looking at. For this week's tax tidbit, I want to introduce you to something heading our way from Europe called MIFID II. Now, it's going to bring some good things like more transparency on the charges we pay on investment funds. So, you know, many people think that they see like a 0.7% and they think that's it. Well, you'll get to see the true horror of how much you're really paying under MIFID II rules next year. But there's also a sting in the tail if you've got a pension plan or a family trust that you set up to just be efficient in terms of things like passing wealth on to the next generation. Because they're introducing a new thing called an LEI, a Legal Entity Identifier. And essentially it's Big Brother wanting to watch even more closely what you're doing than is already happening. We've already got the common reporting standard with overseas banks sending all their information and tax authorities sending all their information to HMRC. Um, now this is to look at both the parties involved in any kind of financial transaction, whether that's buying stocks and bonds or buying assets or whatever. They want to know what the entity is and who's behind it. So, this LEI comes in uh, to effect in January of 2018. I've already had a letter from the people that look after my um, pension saying, uh, if we don't put this in place for you, you will not be able to trade within your pension from the 3rd of January next year. Oh, and by the way, it's gonna be 115 pounds to set this thing up and 70 pounds a year to maintain it. Uh, what do I get for that? Uh, nothing. Okay, so it's a new charge, it's a new uh, fee, a new tax, call it what you will, uh, but it's also there to um, you know, give total and utter clarity and transparency to the authorities on all of your financial dealings. Um, the irony of this is it's actually going to save the financial industry money because it's going to make it easier to tie up various transactions and they'll have a bit less back office admin to do. So the estimates I've seen will look something like $150 million savings uh, to them, uh, but they're not necessarily going to pass that on to you. And the problem is this is really designed for the, the big boy stuff. But of course, when you introduce these kind of sledgehammer rules, 
you know, there are unintended consequences. And there are something like 182,000 family trusts registered in the UK, some of which, which have got you know, very modest amounts of money in them. This is not kind of, uh, you know, Panama Papers tax evasion or something. Uh, it's just been sensible planning over the years. They're all caught up in this. There are no exceptions, apparently, based on the size of the fund. Everybody's got to have one of these LEIs. You're going to have to pay up front for it. And by the way, the fees I gave you are the official fees. There's no cap on what your provider can charge you for doing this for you. So do check if they're putting a chunky margin on there. Um, and there's an ongoing charge as well. So if you're not doing much dealing, if you're not buying many shares or whatever in your fund, having to pay an extra couple of hundred quid like this, you know, it's going to start impacting your returns. So it's just one more little thing to worry about as we try and get on top of things financially. We try and take ownership, we try to do the right thing, but clearly the powers that be, A, want to track every move we make more closely, and B, they want us to pay for the privilege of being watched. So, a mixed bag for you this week, a, a morality tale in terms of Boris Becker, some great new opportunities for you if you run a, an SME business and some new charges you may not have known about. That's what we're here for, to try and keep you fully informed so you can take ownership of your financial future and stay within the 1% or perhaps get there if you aspire to it. So we'll have more of the same for you next week. If there's anything you want to see covered, do just pop some ideas into the comments section below and we'll try and incorporate those into future episodes. Thanks again for watching.